It would be unkind on my part if I didn't take just a moment of time to express my appreciation to the elders for the invitation to be with you. So good to see this congregation and to see your growth and to see your love for one another. I appreciate so much the work Brother Daniel, Brother Guy, and the other men are doing in the preaching of the gospel. And I hope you hold their hands up in the proclamation of the word. You know, there's some who I stay in contact with, and I'll tell you, they get a lot of time because of COVID to get deep relationships. But I'll tell you, there's some very special people here. And one young fellow that I really think a lot of is uh, Carter Watkins. He texts me a lot and keeps in touch with me, and I just appreciate him, his family. Uh, he's a fine young man, and I hope one day he's up here preaching the gospel of Christ. If you have your Bible, if you'll turn with me to the book of Mark in the 15th chapter. And if you don't like this sermon, there's two things. I kind of got this one from a something Will Lovell had said about another sermon I did. So if you don't like it, you can blame Will. And second, if you don't like it, you'll come back next week, you'll hear someone better. So just plan on that. Mark 15, look if you will, down at verse 37. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Then if you take your Bible, turn with me to the Hebrew letter and the 10th chapter. And when you come to Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at verses 19 and 20. Therefore brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. I want you to look at those two verses and you may say, preacher, they don't have anything in common. But I hope as we make our study, we can see a connection at the end. What I'd like to do is examine what Jesus cried out on the cross. And if you take Mark's gospel and you take John, you remember that John said that when Jesus Christ was dying, he yelled out, it is finished. Then Mark comes with the statement, he breathed his last. And notice when he breathed his last, what occurred? The divine revelation says that the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, torn asunder. So when I look at that, I begin to think about some things I need to go back and understand about the temple so I can make proper application for today. The first thing I want you to think about is in the day of Jesus, what the temple was like. Now this would have been the third temple. You remember you had the one that Solomon built and was destroyed. Then you had the one that they built when they came back from exile. And now you have the third temple. This was built by Herod. And it was a beautiful and, and majestic building. It was huge and impressive. The temple itself, the building was not all that big, but it was long and slender and it, it was tall. And so you had gold surrounding the building. Can you imagine walking into the city of Jerusalem and seeing the sun of the Palestinian sky coming down upon that beautiful structure and the gold just shining over the city. The Jews were proud of that structure. And so here in their mind, here was a beautiful uh, building surrounded by courtyards. And when you go into that temple, you went through what was called the Golden Gate. Really, it wasn't gold. It was bronze, but they kept it polished. And it was a large gate. It took 20 men to open and shut the gate. So here you have individuals who are going to the temple. They see the beautiful gold. They go through this beautiful gate. But when they get there, there's different courtyards. The first you'll find is the courtyard of the Gentiles. And it was called that by name because anyone could go there. This was a courtyard that anybody could walk into and they would not be charged with any crime. Over time, though, it became a place of business. You remember in the book of Mark in the 11th chapter, in verse 15, when Jesus goes into the temple, this is the courtyard he goes into, and he sees them buying and selling the animals and making a profit. And Jesus is angered by that. And Jesus overturns the tables, and Jesus drives them out. He said, my father's house, which is to be a prayer, a place of prayer for all nations, that's the court of the Gentiles, you've made into a den of thieves. So you look and you'll find this courtyard, you could see everybody there. Did not matter your, your gender, did not matter your nationality, all were welcome. But along the end of the courtyard of the Gentiles, there's this long wall. And every so often on the wall, there was a sign that warned the Gentiles, you can't go any further. This is as far as you can go. And if you take one step further, you are under the penalty of death. 
So once you think about these are as close to the holy place that the Jews or the Gentiles could go. Now keep that in mind. Everyone's welcome. But then I'll go a little closer and you'll find the second courtyard was for Jewish women only. Now, Jewish men could go there and Jewish women, but Gentiles could not go into this place. This is where Mary and Joseph brought Jesus when he was a baby in Luke 2 to present him to the Lord. This is where Simeon came in and took Jesus up in his arms in Luke 2, 25 through 32 and said, My eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. I can now depart in peace. It's here that Anna comes in Luke 2 and talks about the Redeemer in verses 36 through 38. So you have this courtyard. It's not the Gentile courtyard. It's a little closer to the most holy place. And here the women could go, but this is as far as Mary could go. Mary could not take one further step. This is the courtyard she was bound to. But now Joseph could go another courtyard. Because just up the next flight of steps, you're in the courtyard of what was called the Sons of Israel, their courtyard. And when you think about this courtyard, I want you to observe the beginning to thin out. The crowd that was so many in the court of the Gentiles, by the time you get to the court of the women and now to the court of the men, the crowd's getting smaller. But you know, that's as far as Joseph could go. Now, Joseph could look around and he could see in the next courtyard what was going on. That was the courtyard of the priest. That's where they're doing their work. That's where they're tending to the sacrifices. They're keeping the altar of burnt offering, which needed to be tended to, constantly burning. You, that's where Zechariah in Luke 1, beginning at verse 15, he's not just going to be in the courtyard. He's going to get to go into the holy place. Now, not the most holy place. But you remember in Luke chapter 1, it says in verse 9, it's going to be his turn to burn incense. Now, this wasn't something you've got to do every day. In fact, it said his name, is, he drew lots and he, it was his name. He probably, though he was aged, first time ever being in there. And when you look in the book of Luke and the first chapter, notice he goes into this magnificent structure. And no doubt he's nervous. No doubt there's a feeling of unworthiness. And what does he do? He offers up what God told him to do. But notice he's alone. The closer you got to the most holy place, the smaller the crowd. Because at that time there were restrictions. But he couldn't go any further. There you had the veil that's a hundred feet tall and at least an inch and a half or more thick just woven together. And that separated everybody from where God was supposed to be, the most holy place. And only the high priest could go in there and that once a year. That, when he goes in, he had to do with extreme care. He had to follow the instruction of God. And notice when he goes in, he goes in taking blood, Leviticus 16, 3 and 4. He's got to go in and he's got to do, do all the blood, on, the, on not only on himself, but also on the mercy seat and all that. But not just that. In verses 12 and 13 of Leviticus 16, he still goes in with incense. There's always a veil. This represented the presence of God. This was the most holy place. And no one could look upon that with just eyes only. Now you think about that. We're told what goes beyond the scripture. In scripture, we're told what goes beyond the veil. It doesn't say that it's some magnificent building. What it says is there's the angels that had been carved out. That there's the mercy seat that had gold overlaid it. It wasn't like some pagan shrine where they had some big gold image there. But because of what it represented in its heyday, only the high priest could go once a year. But what was in that box? When they go in and they sprinkle blood and it had the mercy seat, what did the mercy seat cover? The Ark of the Covenant. Well, what was in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. And you remember what had happened with the Ten Commandments? They'd been broken by the people. That's why nobody could go in there. The closer they got to the holiness of God, the law of God, they saw no one had a right to go in there. And that's what God's telling them. You've broken all these things. I've given you law. I've given you all these things to keep you holy. You've not kept any of it. And the only one who could have went in there is someone who had never sinned. So when you get to think about that, 
You think about access being restricted to the place God's presence has dwelt. Remember, this temple was designed by God. Herod built it, but he copied God's uh, pattern because in Exodus 25, 80, remember God told Moses, you built everything according to the pattern you saw when you were with me on the mountain. That's repeated in Hebrews 8, 5. So God designed the pattern and gave it to Moses. Herod copied it. And what God is saying is, notice who can come in my presence. None of you really are fit. Because you haven't kept my commandments. You've fallen short of my law. And the picture is that behind the veil, God alone is there. Now I want you to think about now what we read a moment ago in Mark. In Mark, when Jesus dies, what happens immediately? That veil is torn asunder. God came down from heaven and ripped the curtain apart. The death of Jesus is my permit and your permit to come into the presence of God. Because in 1 Peter 2, 24, Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross. There's no longer a barrier. There's no longer a barrier to come into the presence of God. And we come in, says the Hebrew writer, through the veil, which is the torn body of Jesus. And you think about that veil, beautiful in color, had blue, which represented uh, heavenly origin, and, and had uh, uh, purple, which represents royalty, and white, which represents purity. Just this beautiful. And yet it's torn and strung. Why? Christ fulfilled everything. He was sinless. He could go into the Holy of Holies, and now he is in the Holy of Holies in heaven as our high priest. Out there on the cross, He bore our sins in His body on the tree. Out there on the cross, He made a claim. It is finished. And in there, in the temple, God the Father says, yes, it is. They'll have access. Who can have access? All of them. No longer are you going to be separated if you're a Gentile or a woman or a man. All are going to be priests if they're in Christ. Look, if you will, in 1 Peter chapter 2. And notice that Christ is the barrier remover and the way maker. Look in 1 Peter 2. Look down at verse 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're a priest. You're thankful for that. Aren't you thankful that every time you have some sin on your mind, you ain't got to come down the building, come up to the front and look in there and tell somebody you've sinned? But we go to God through Christ. Christ has removed the barriers. He removed the barrier of sin. Isaiah 59, 2. Your sins have separated you from God. It's not that God can't hear, he said. It's not that God can't see. The problem is, he said, is you have committed that which put a barrier between you and God. On the cross, he removed that. On the cross, Colossians 2, 14, he took out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. That's the law of Moses. He nailed that to the cross. In 1 Corinthians 15, he's going to remove the barrier of death. So when I go to Hebrews chapter 4, and I think about the fact that I can go to my heavenly Father, I think of that statement, our high priest sympathizes with us. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So when I go to my Father, I have a mediator who understands both sides. Him being God, the Son, understands the holiness of God. Him being man, understands my side. And therefore, He's the mediator. You ever thought about what a joy it is to have someone who understands your side? God in His holiness, He understands that. Us in our weakness, He understands that. And He's able to bring us together. He's the great mediator. But I want to tell you something. Can I say what I think one of the problems is? There's a lot of veils that still need to be torn asunder. Because sin still separates us of God if we've not put on Christ. What was it that gave the high priest access to the uh, most holy place? The blood. What gives us access to God? The blood. Whose blood? Jesus' blood. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, he said, Do you not know that as many of you who were baptized were baptized into his death? In Revelation 1, 5, he said, These are those who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You have to have the blood of Christ applied if you're going to come into the presence of God. Why? The blood's what removed the barrier. It removed the sin. It removed the old law. It puts us in justified state before God. But I want to tell you something else. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you'll see that when Moses had come down after seeing the glory of God, 
in 2 Corinthians 3, the people can't look at him. And you remember that they, in verse 7, they could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance. The old law, he said, that's been passing away. He said, but when they looked upon Moses, it scared him. So what did Moses do? He had to put a veil on And notice what he says as he continues on down in uh, verse 13. He says, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily, <clears throat> steadily at the end of what was passing away, their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. And that's what he's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When he talks about the face of Christ in verse 6, he said, you couldn't look at Moses and all he had was the glory of the old law. He said, I want you to understand how more glorified Jesus is when you look on his face. But the veil is being removed. I like that. The Lord Christ takes away the veil. And notice what he says in verse 15 of chapter 3. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on the heart. That's with the old law. But he says in verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, the veil's taken away. Well, where's the veil today? He tells us in chapter 4, it's not because of the old law. Where's the veil? He says in verse 3, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the, age, the God of this age has blinded. Now, you take verse 4, he talks about our minds being blinded. You go back up to chapter 3, verse 14, their minds were blinded. The difference being Satan is putting the veil there. Why? He said, lest they believe the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine on them. You want to know what's happened to this world? You want to know what's happened in Limestone County in Athens, Alabama? Somehow, somewhere, we've let the devil get an upper hand with the world and he's veiled the glory of the gospel. And somehow, we've even allowed it to sink into our lives where we're almost ashamed to let our light shine. We're almost ashamed to let someone know we're a Christian. We're almost ashamed to let someone know we're a member of the O'Neill Church. And then we look around and we say, well, I tell you, the church is dying, the church is sinking. I want to tell you, could it be because we have veiled the gospel? But not that only. But have we not put classes on people? Have we not put restrictions on people? Have we seen certain people say, that's not the kind of people. I'll tell you, I went to a place, I won't say where. A fella came up to me and he said, now preacher, we hope to grow, but we want good members. Good members? Do you want a club or do you want a church? The Lord didn't die for a club. He died for the church. I want to tell you something. When people come, no matter their background, no matter their position in life, there should be rejoicing that they are now in the family of God. I'll tell you something that really has bothered me over the years. I remember when I first started preaching, you'd preach the gospel, someone would come forward, tears everywhere in the building, rejoicing going on. Now you look around and someone comes forward, people ready to go, oh, we're going to miss the lunch buffet, the Baptists are going to be just there. We get upset over something like that. I'll tell you. The closer you get to the holy God, you mark it down, the smaller the crowd. You remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? You had Judas coming with a multitude. You had eight sitting. You had three. Then you had Jesus. The closer you get to Jesus, the smaller the crowd, but the better the crowd. And one day, that which has been veiled is going to be completely taken away. The older I get, the more clear Jesus comes to me. Because I'm getting closer to meeting Him. And what's it say in 1 John 3, 2? We shall see Him as He is. I don't know what Jesus looks like. I remember when a little boy, my grandmother had a picture, and I said, well, that's what he looked like. No, I don't know what he looks like. But I want to tell you what, I'll know him when I see him. The question is, how close are you to the Holy God?
A lot of people are content to stay out in the court of the Gentiles, just make business, just have fun, be superficial, just try to have our name in the church directory, just have our toe in the kingdom, and just hope. That's enough. I want to tell you something. God pity the day that that's our attitude. And the attitude is that I want to be closer to my father. I was preaching here when my father died. And I used that text in Mark for his funeral sermon. And some of you came and it meant so much to us. Comfort us in our time of grief. And I thank you for that. But there's going to come a time I breathe my last. And you know, I already want to be close to the Father. I want to have the relationship here that I expect to have with Him in heaven. I know there's some veils in the way. But the closer I get to Him, they get removed. Until finally, I'm in His presence. Don't let anyone or anything veil your view of the Son of God. If you need to obey the gospel and be baptized, the blood of Christ will give you access to the throne of God. As together we stand and sing, we invite you to come.